Today, we're going to learn more about the effects of solitary confinement. We're going to learn more about the vehicle that was parked by the CPS building. We're going to hear from an expert in tool marks about how you can't match an unfired cartridge casing with a cartridge casing that has been fired. Yep. And last but not least, and you're not going to want to miss this part, um, something, an interesting development with Libby's cell phone. So, lot to get to. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Crafting and Crime Daily. I'm your host, Rebecca, and I recap live trials, only this one's not live. But if you want to go back, you know, watch the episodes you may have missed, go to my playlist, Crafting and Crime Daily Podcast, and uh, it'll be all the ones that have the red thumbnail, and they're numbered. So, uh, yeah, I'll link the playlist up here. And, well, we have a lot to talk about. And we're not going to talk about the election. Psst. Done. It's over with. We're all friends again. Okay. <laughs> all right. At least the calls will stop. The advertising will stop. Thank you, Jesus. Anyway, so first person on the stand. Well, let me just back up a back up the wheels here. This is the state of Indiana versus Richard Allen. He is on trial for the murders of Abby Williams and Libby German. They were 13 and 14 year olds um, back when they were um, abducted from the Monon High Trails off the Monon High Bridge on February 13th of 2017. Had a day off, nice day. They went hiking. They were found deceased the next day. North east of the Monon High Bridge uh, in an area north of the Deer Creek that runs under the bridge. They had been uh, stabbed to death. Uh, but there's this whole issue with a bullet because their bodies were strategically placed in sort of a V and between their feet buried <laughs> into the dirt and under some leaves. They found an unspent cartridge casing. And that will come into play during some of the testimony today. But stick around to the end because there's there's some interesting fact that came out about Libby's cell phone that you're not you're not going to believe. Okay, so the first person on the stand is Betsy Blair. She was a witness that was called by the state earlier. She had been on the bridge. She talked about who she saw on the bridge and and how she had driven by that day. And she says she saw a car. Now, on cross-examination during the state's uh, case in chief, the defense tried to ask her about this car, and the prosecution objected beyond the scope that was sustained, which means they had to bring back this witness during their case in chief, the defense did. So they put, they put Betsy back on the stand, and they asked her, the state ever asked you about a car? <laughs> Um, no. So she was on the trail between about 145 and 215. So, uh, she said she saw a car park way out in the back of this CPS building, which is unusual. Like, why would you park way out in the back? Um, it said it was a sedan, uh, it had sharp angles. It was very similar to her father's 65 Mercury Comet, um, an indescript color, but you know, it wasn't black. And it was backed in to the parking lot. So, so we get that testimony and jury gets to hear it. Then they put on um, a psychiatrist um, who actually specializes in the effects, or he's done a lot of research in the effects of solitary confinement on people. He is a medical doctor psychologists are not medical doctors. Psychiatrists are medical doctors. But this guy went one step further and he became a JD. So he's also uh, qualified to be an attorney, it's similar to what I did. I was a registered nurse and then I became a JD, an attorney. So he, uh, he is well known for his theories on the effects of solitary confinement. But 
the judge limited his testimony to generalizations. He's not allowed to talk about Richard Allen specifically, just talk about the effects of solitary confinement. But there's a few times when he's asked questions during his testimony where he'll give the generality and then he'll go, such as when Richard Allen, and he'll try to get it out real quick before there's an objection. And sometimes he does. And even if the objection is sustained, the jury's heard what this guy's saying. He's a smart expert. So uh, he does say that Richard Allen appeared delirious in the videos. And then um, he said that he was asked if there's an international body that, that governs solitary confinement or has an opinion on solitary confinement. And he says there's not really an international body that has any standards or anything like that, but the UN, the United Nations, considers anything over 15 days to be torture, a form of torture. So uh, he said the, the reactions to solitary confinement are delirium, confusion, loss of memory, uh, smearing feces. He says very common, very common. Uh, acting out sexually, being naked, um, and and of course, a very extreme reaction would be to harm themselves and and death, suicide. So um, he talked about how many people develop false memories, but experience them as true. He says, when you try to re, and this is, I thought this part was interesting. When you're trying to recreate a memory, all you're doing is recreating. The memory that you had before you're not recreating the actual event um like that one i fell asleep trying to figure that one out last night i'm like so if you're wouldn't it always be the same it's not every time you recreate the memory some of it changes you know so Real memories, he says, there's a couple different kinds of memories. Real memories are perceptual, sensory. Um, you know, they've got smells and they've got sounds. And But these false memories usually begin as a belief. Like, I believe such and such happened, you know. So um, this was his testimony. He wasn't allowed to say such as Richard Allen had this false memory. <laughs> so the jury asked a question and said, can you go back to normal once you've exhibited all this um, delirium and this, you know, these reactions from solitary confinement, can you go back to normal? And uh, the psychiatrist says, absolutely. I've seen it happen. Yes. You can be normal get into this psychotic state and then go back to normal. And so I thought that was interesting. Okay. Next person on the stand was Dr. Warren, who is a forensic firearm and tool mark examiner. There's a national uh, association of firearm examiners. It's called NAFTI firearm and tool mark examiners. NAFTI. He's on the board of directors for that. So he knows his stuff. He does firearms analysis and crime scene reconstruction. He's got a lot of edu education. Um, he says you, you really can't compare cycled bullets with test-fired rounds. It, it, it just, you just can't. <laughs> so, because there's a difference in the pressure, and the, the amount of that pressure is what's creating the marks. So... He says, you really should be comparing apples to apples. Like in this case, they're comparing apples to kumquats. <laughs> so um, he says, these tool marks have to be repeatable and reproducible. And we didn't see any of that uh, here where they did it several times and they were able to you know, produce the same marks as the unspent round. And, um, you know, I, 
He said there was insufficient agreement between the items that Ms. Oberg compared. So what he, he didn't look at the actual gun or the actual bullet. He did all of his work by looking at the photographs that she took. Um, and he said, that's sufficient you know, that he, he can tell what he needs to tell. He can testify to what he needs to testify by looking at these photographs. And, and Ms. Oberg is the two marks examiner that testified on behalf of the state that said they were, comparable. And he said, no, there's insufficient agreement between these two. <laughs> uh, no. So one of the jurors asked, oh, actually, look, before I get there, <laughs> there was a lot of back and forth between the attorney and this guy and getting a question answered. And uh, the judge kept interrupting. And the, it, it was like everybody was talking over everybody. And apparently the, one of the jurors shouted at the judge, <laughs> would you just let him answer the question? <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. I would love to have seen that. Would you just let him answer the question? I like this guy. I like this juror. Okay. Interesting, huh? All right, so next person on the stand, Stacy Eldridge. She is a former FBI CAST member. CAST is the uh, division of the FBI that examines cell phones. So uh, she no longer works there. She's a forensic cell phone digital examiner. Now she has her own business. She testifies and um, examines phones. She... Um, what she did was she looked at all of the extractions. She doesn't like to use Cellbrite, but she took all of the information that they have from these extractions. And she ran Libby's phone. She got the Knowledge C database from Libby's phone. Now, what the Knowledge C database tells us, and I think I've mentioned this before, and something I learned new during this case, the Knowledge C database tells us, like, when the phone is turned off, when the phone's turned on, when, you know, that kind of thing that kind of data, like what app was being used when. So on February 13th, throughout the course of that day, Libby's phone kept going, uh, losing signal. It would go in and out that day. And the last connection that it had was 5.45 p.m. Not 2.32 5.45 p.m. That's the last signal that connected. And then uh, it reconnects at 4.33 a.m. on February 14th. So we didn't hear much about location data, which is unfortunate. But you could tell from the knowledge C that AT&T was repeatedly trying to ping this phone. But at 5.45 p.m. on February 13th, apparently there's a code in the Knowledge C database that whoever examined this before didn't recognize what that code meant. That code meant that there were wireless headphones plugged in at that time. 5.45 p.m. on February 13th. Under the state's theory, the girls are already dead. The phone is underneath Libby, underneath a shoe. Um, but someone plugged in wireless headphones. And milliseconds before that occurred, there was an incoming phone call. Then there's no phone activity again until... 10.32 p.m. Which would be when the headphones were removed. So on cross-examination, the state said, could there be any other explanation for it? What if water got into the connection? And uh, he says, Is that... yes, it could register as um, wireless headphones being plugged in. But how does that explain it getting disconnected at 10.30? You know? 
the water is not going to dissipate. It's underneath a shoe, underneath a body in the middle of the forest overnight. That water is not going to, if the water's there, it's there. It's not going to unplug itself. So, you know, it's not going to dry up. So I thought that was interesting. Um, water could register as headphones. And he was asked, where did you, because what they did was uh, the state put on uh, an expert to say this, water could register as headphones. And so the defense gets up and says, where did you learn that? That water could affect the headphones. And he says, oh, I Googled it. I Googled it. Interesting. Okay. That's where we're at. That was a uh, sign of a quick day, I guess. But uh, is it a reasonable doubt? I, I think there is. I think there's quite a bit of reasonable doubt uh, as things go. So uh, I'll be live tonight. Craft with me Wednesday. I'm going to start this um, Christmas Lego set. It's not Lego. It's, you know, an all alternate brand, but it is not the minis. It's a regular size. And it's, oh my God, so stinking cute. Anyway, so we're going to start that tonight. That'll be at 7 p.m. Eastern. I'm sorry, 7 p.m. Central Time. I don't want to confuse anybody. 8 Eastern, 7 Central. Um, if I don't see you there, I'll see you in Crafting and Crime Daily tomorrow. Have a wonderful day, everybody.